You are Locked On Blue Devils, your daily podcast on the Duke Blue Devils, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome into another edition of the Lockdown Blue Devils podcast here on this Wednesday. Thank you so much for listening to our show. My name is JJ Jackson. I'm proud to be the host, and we appreciate you for making us your first listen each and every day. If you haven't done so already, follow the show on Twitter at LO underscore Blue Devils. Any questions that you might have, we're getting ready for our next installment of Mailbag Monday, so send them our way. The Duke Athletics world continues to move on. The same could be said for Duke basketball, Duke football. We're now 10 days away from the spring game and Mike Elko's first run as head coach of the Duke Blue Devils. On today's show, my very good friend Ryan Lohman at the Duke Nation on Twitter joins the program. We'll bring him in and we'll have a whole lot of fun here on today's edition of Locked on Blue Devils. Ryan Lohman with us on the show once again. He's becoming one of my favorite guests to have on the podcast Ryan, I'm grateful for the time. The season did not end the way that we wanted it to, but uh, you and I were just talking. It picked up right away. As soon as that buzzer went final, we're seeing news after news after news come out. Yeah, man, I wish we would have been able to recap a national championship game. Um, Unfortunately, it didn't end like that, uh, but... As they say, Duke basketball never stops. And within days, actually, we've had more news than I was expecting um, with some of the Duke targets on the recruiting trail coming out and and setting announcement dates and all of that. But then obviously coaching changes and everything that I'm sure we'll get to. Um, Yeah, I just wish it was about a week or so delayed than what we got. But here we are. Um, And uh, yeah, let's jump into it. Yeah, today we're going to talk about some of the staff changes that have taken place, some roster questions going into next year. Uh, and a little bit more in the Duke basketball world. So after yesterday's program went up on the air as we continued throughout the afternoon on Tuesday, uh, we learned that Mike Schrocki was parting ways with Elon University. This was something that had been rumored for quite some time. The former Duke basketball director of operations and assistant coach at the Power 5 level for a number of years let go by Elon a mutual parting of ways. Things were not going as planned. Uh, seven and eleven was his record in the CAA in their last two full seasons of basketball, not including the COVID year. And so he makes the decision to depart. And it seems as though he's going to be officially introduced as the next uh, assistant coach for Duke men's basketball. Talk to me about this, Ryan. Yeah, and obviously you you mentioned it. It kind of been rumored for a little bit. Um, it, it was people were calling it the worst kept secret. Um, and and do surrounding Duke basketball. Um, yeah, he he was uh, a part of Duke's basketball program for quite some time uh, prior to going to. Uh, I think he's been at Ohio State as an assistant, Butler as an assistant, Stanford as an assistant, and then uh, at Elon. He uh, but his former position at Duke, he was a head of academics and recruiting coordinator, and then he jumped to director of basketball operations for about six years. So um, definitely some ties to Duke. It sounds like there's a chance he takes some more uh, more of a specialty role where he may not be as active out on the recruiting trail, but um, more of like that right hand man of of Shire as an assistant, um, seeing as he's been around the the game. Much much longer than than Shire so looking forward to that I've heard a lot of great things about him from people that I've that I've talked to so um yeah I, I'm looking forward to that obviously Nolan Smith departing uh to to be an associate head coach at Louisville was was a big one um and that one was another bad or poorly kept secret as well everybody kind of saw that one that one coming it's awesome for Nolan that he's well deserved I'm, I'm super happy for him um hurts Duke a little bit. I think a lot of people, and this isn't a knock on Nolan. I think a lot of people are a little bit overreacting just because obviously he's, he's kind of that uh, guy that people have been relying on to be the the future in college basketball. He's going to be a really good recruiter and all that, but he's only been doing it for a couple of years now. Um, so I'm wondering, I'm not saying he's not going to be great and it's not a big loss, but people forget that Shire has been the lead recruit on a lot of these big name guys that we've had in the past five, six, seven years. So um, yes, it, it is a loss, but uh, I still think Shire has the tools and the staff going forward to, to get the job done. And here's unfortunately the position that we're in. And a lot of this is that John Shire is 33 years old. He's taken over for the greatest head coach to ever do it. And Mike Krzyzewski 
and his running mate from back in his college days, Nolan Smith, was an assistant coach on the staff. As you said, this past season when Nate James gets the Austin P job, Coach K comes to Nolan, lets him be a full-time assistant, lets him get out on the road recruiting, and we see how well he's done at that. But there's got to be some human nature element involved in all of this. And as much as you love Duke University, and that's not going to stop by Nolan Smith being the associate head coach at Louisville, there's still a part of you that human nature, you want to get to the top at whatever you're doing, and you want to have room to grow and flexibility and financial money gains that can come from this. And so in a lot of ways, I I think it is important to point out the fact that uh, like, it's okay that Nolan Smith decided to make this decision for himself, because if you do connect the dots, I just don't know that there's much room for growth at Duke for Nolan Smith anymore, knowing now that John Shire is the head coach and that they're practically the same age. Yeah, exactly. And, and I, I'm not, I'm not going to, I can't predict the future, but if things go let's just say things go poorly with Shire for the first five years and it doesn't work out and no one is an associate head coach at Louisville and they're doing great. What better person to have being groomed at And if he's being successful at Louisville to bring back and, and maybe in some capacity um, in some crazy future, Shire doesn't work out. You bring back no one as a head coach. I, I'm not saying it's going to happen. I, I think Shire's going to be great. I think he's going to be the next head coach for, for 20, 30, 40 years, but Uh, It's great for Nolan to go out and get that experience, do it at a different school, see how other schools are running things, see if he can recruit at, I get Louisville is a a power five school, it's a big name school, but it's not Duke, let's be honest. So if he can continue that success there. Um, And then as I tweeted the other day, uh, it's expected that Emil Jefferson, who is the director of player development, is going to be promoted to a full-time assistant, basically replacing Nolan's role. Um, I think that's huge for Emil. Emil's uh, a guy who can go out on the recruiting trail and prove firsthand that what Duke can do for you and your career and your development as a basketball player. Emil came in, not super highly touted, but he improved drastically over his four years and eventually was a national champion. So for anybody to go out there and and replace Nolan on the recruiting trail from a Duke player's perspective, um, I think Emil Jefferson's a great guy to do that. Yeah, as you mentioned, a national champion, a multi-year captain for the Duke men's basketball team, had some several good years playing for the Orlando Magic off the bench. As a player, uh, Emil is one of the grittiest guys that you're going to come across and just always loved doing the dirty work and someone that loves Duke University. And getting him in a recruiting capacity, I think, is absolutely incredible for Duke basketball. We'll see if that officially is the direction that Duke tries to go in. I guess there is still the idea that you could keep Emil in the same position that he's currently in for another season, given that he's only one year removed from basketball. It was kind of under the radar that this came to be. Last season, Mike Krzyzewski broke the news on the Steam Room podcast with Ernie Johnson and Charles Barkley, and I'm listening to it, and I'm like, is this real? I send it to our buddy Zion Ojaletti, and then all of a sudden he posts it, reposts it, and it takes off like crazy that Emil's coming back to kind of join the staff in a smaller uh, capacity that he's got there in, in player development. So – Uh, There's still the outside chance a more experienced assistant coach could be in the mix and that sort of thing. But when you have the Duke basketball connections, what we're saying here, Ryan, is that you have multiple options if you're John Shire in the direction that you want to go. Yeah, exactly. And I still think there's another role that they can fill. So I I was told by a a guy who's always been reliable to me that it is that that Emil will be an assistant coach next year. Um, it's, and I think they're with some changes in rules, they're allowed to have five assistants. So you don't have to technically bring in a player development. If you have, you have Carewell, you'd have, uh, Emil Jefferson, you'd have, uh, Stra- Sh- sorry, I can't say his name right. Shroggy. I can, I always want to go a different direction with it, but Shroggy. Um, and then you would bring in, uh, another guy or two for assistant role and then a player development role. So, um, but yeah, if you're John Shire, names have been thrown out. I mean, everybody wants to throw out that I've seen my mentions all the time has been JJ Redick and, and, and Jay Williams, both who are TV personalities now making buku bucks with their <laughs> brands. Um, I, I, neither of those that I don't think are happening. Um, I think more realistic ones are, are Tyler Thornton, who is, uh, I think he's on, on the staff at Howard. Um, I don't think Quinn Cook is an option. I think he's still, I I tweeted this the other day as well. He's still trying to get back to the NBA and and rightfully so he's a great player. Um, And then, and then Wojo is another name that's been thrown around, but I just, I don't think, I think that's too much. I think that'd be too many 
cooks in the kitchen as far as experience goes, head coaching experience. I don't think Shire needs that many guys in his ear. So it'll be interesting. I, I don't mind the Tyler Thornton stuff. Um, and there's there's so many options with with the brotherhood that could surprise us, kind of like a meal just came out of nowhere. So we'll, we'll see what direction they go. We'll certainly see what the case is for Duke men's basketball moving forward as, again, John Shire has to make changes to the coaching staff as we get ready to kick off his era as the Duke men's basketball coach. Chatting here with Ryan Lohman. He is the host of uh, Duke Crazy Twitter Live, also runs the at the Duke Nation Twitter page and more here on the program. Let's take one quick break and then we'll have more right after this. Today's edition here of Locked On Blue Devils is brought to you by our friends over at Built Bar. Built Bar is the best tasting protein bar that you're going to be able to find. I absolutely love Built Bar and what it does for me each and every morning. Built Bar helps me get my day started. It's so delicious. So many awesome flavors to choose from. 100% real chocolate as most Built Bars contain 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Compare that to a candy bar, which usually has around 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar, and dozens of net carbs. You're making a wise decision when you choose Built Bar. Go to Built.com, use promo code LOCKED15, and get 15% off your order. Promo code LOCKED15, L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5, for 15% off your order at Built.com. Welcome back in here to Locked On Blue Devils. My name is JJ Jackson, joined today by Ryan Lohman. We're talking all things Duke basketball here on this Wednesday. All right, so John Schneider needs to put together a coaching staff, but uh, I guess more importantly, Ryan, a coach needs players to coach, and uh, what goes with that are decisions that need to be made by some of these Duke players in terms of what their future will be uh, at this age. In college basketball, we have gotten to the point where pretty much everybody has to make an announcement whether you're staying or leaving. It is unreal, but we've seen that all across America with other teams that have been eliminated from the NCAA tournament. Guys that are sixth, seventh, eighth on benches at schools are having to make announcements that they're coming back because you just never know in this day and age in the transfer portal that are already over 1,000 names in the transfer portal, and not to mention guys like at Duke trying to make the decision to go on to the NBA draft. What's that looking like for Duke? Kind of run through all the players and, and decisions that they've got looming. Yeah, so I think right now um, I'd prepare for a mass exodus if I was a Duke fan. Um, obviously, Paulo Bancaro will be a top three, two, one draft pick. I'm hoping for number one. I think he has that kind of talent um, and that kind of franchise changing talent. Um, and then you have uh, Mark Williams, who has played his way into the lottery and in, in a lot of mock drafts, I think. Um, I believe he's at, yeah, he's right in the lottery at number 11 on the latest ESPN um, mock draft. Uh, and then obviously AJ Grifton is a lottery pick. So those three are the ones that all Duke fans 1000% should expect to, to leave. Uh, I'm not, there's no question about it. Um, and then you look at guys like Trevor Keels and Wendell Moore, who I, these are the ones in my mentions that I've seen the most people being like, well, could they come back? Could Wendell be a four-year Duke player? Could Keels, uh, he obviously after the, the beginning of the season didn't have a great uh, overall season, I'd say until that uh, North Carolina game. So I would still lean towards about 95 to 99% chance of those two going. Um, I think Keels is more is more likely to come back than, than, uh, than more at this point. I don't think Wendell with another year could improve his drafts draft stock that drastically. I don't think he'd be a lottery pick, especially being older. He's younger for his class technically, but, um, just being a fourth year player in college, I, I think your draft stock kind of is what it is at this point. Uh, and, and obviously unless crazy things happen next season, but he's more of a Swiss army knife player, does it all, uh, plays that role very well. So I think he'd be going late first round, early first round or early second round. Um, I'd expect Wendell to be gone. And then Keels is one that is an interesting one because I think a lot of Duke fans would say, could, could look back and say, man, he just needed one more year. And with uh, the NIL stuff, maybe he could make um, a, a few extra dollars this next year staying in college, but he's the type that's had his mindset on pro since coming to Duke. And so if he gets good feedback, which I would assume he could, he, 
uh, lease for the draft with the uh, option to come back. I don't think I, I don't think that would shock me. Um, but I think if he gets first round feedback, he's probably going to go. Um, so. And then the, the last one is Jeremy Roach. I think I haven't heard anything that says he's going to leave. I wouldn't be surprised if you go to see feedback. If, if I'm a college kid, why not? If, if you have NBA aspirations, there's no reason not to go test the waters and just get that NBA feedback. So um, I could see a scenario where he does that, but ultimately I am very confident that Jeremy Roach is back on this team next season. But I, I would be shocked if uh, Wendell Moore, Paulo Bancaro, AJ Griffin, Mark Williams, and Trevor Keels, if, if all of them, I wouldn't be shocked if they're all gone. Yeah, it's a situation where you've got the most to gain by going and kind of get those feedback from exactly. NBA executives and the powers that be so you can make the most informed decision. And the way the college basketball landscape is now structured, credit to them for allowing you to take that step while maintaining your eligibility and now factoring in our first full season of NIL. It's still college baseball and softball season now. It's still the academic calendar. We have not officially – finished the first academic year of NIL. Like we're still so new in the infancy stages of all of this. To your credit, Trevor Keels working with that Outback Steakhouse money. He and Caleb Love in the state are throwing Outback parties for Super Bowls and just everything. So those guys are, are well represented at Duke and that sort of thing, but they do have a lot of opportunities. If it's so Jeremy Roach, I'm I'm seeing the same thing, kind of the most likely to come back. Between Wendell and Trevor Keels, those other two kind of, uh, I, I guess we'll call them question marks, who's more likely of those two if it were to just be one? To come back, I would say, oh, that's tough. Because like in my heart, I want to say Wendell because he's been at Duke for so long, but I, I think Keels is probably more likely. I think if uh, with Wendell, like I said, it, the only way he'd improve his draft stock dramatically, I think would be if he came back and averaged 18 to 20 some points a game. And I don't think this roster next year would suit him to do that. So he would play, if he were to come back, hypothetically, if, if, if Dell came back, he would play that two role, which is the role that we kind of need right now. Um, but he would still be that guy who can play off the, off the ball with Roach or can run the point. Um, you're going to have guys like Whitehead, Lively and, and Filipowski and, and Mitchell and even, even shoot who are going to want to get there. So like, I don't think the door is open for him to average that much more points next year. So I, I just don't see the reason to come back other than just a Duke legacy, but I don't think he's at that point right now. I don't think that's much of a thing anymore. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I think Keels is more more likely to come back than than Wendell at this point. Hey, let me reword this question because I'm curious where you're at on this, and uh, I got to put you on the spot. Obviously, we love all these guys; they're all Duke guys. Yeah. But looking at those two players in particular, Wendell Moore Jr. and Trevor Keels, five years from now, if we're buying into a professional NBA career, who's got the better odds there? Oh man, that's a great question. I, Ooh. I'm going to go with Keels based on potential. I, I'm with you. And that's why that's yeah. why I'm sort of in the position that you're at where, unfortunately, for Duke, like you're saying, I don't know that there is anything else for Wendell Moore Jr. to gain in that NBA world by yep. coming back another season. This is about as high as it can get. And knowing that Keels has all that potential, has the physical build that he has, I think that door is open for him a little bit longer and also more as a junior as opposed to a freshman that we're talking about. I'm in agreement with you. I just wanted to see where you were. Yeah, I, and, and it's so tough because, like, right now I, I don't have any like – I, I have people I can talk I, I talk to, but I don't have – at this point it's way too early for anybody to be making, like, accurate pre predictions on who's coming back and or, or who you would take in, in the future and stuff. But when it comes to Keels, he's just got that more NBA style play. He's got, like you said, he's got the body. Wendell does have the body, but Keels has got the trigger. He pulls, he shoots it as much as anybody. We obviously saw that a lot this year. He's confident um, when he gets downhill, he's really good at finishing and getting fouled. So I just think his ceiling is higher than Wendell's. Um, and I, I do think he could benefit um, from testing the waters and possibly coming back, but I, I wouldn't knock Keels for going. If he's going to be a first round pick, go get that money, go get the millions. It's it, that's way bigger than what you're going to get in college. So um, that's where my head's at right now, but Hey, I hope I'm wrong, man. I'd love to see Keels back. Ladies and gentlemen, Ryan Loman is selling himself short because this guy <laughs> has connections just about everywhere. What he's not telling you 
is the he has at least half of the NBA executives on speed dial, so he's gonna <laughs> try and get in touch with all of them and see what these draft grades look like. I wish, man, I guys. wish. At the Duke Nation on Twitter is where you can find his stuff. We wrap up our show in just a moment. Today's edition of Locked On Blue Devils is brought to you by Rock Auto. RockAuto.com is where you need to be. With the ever increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible to go for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts that you need. Why endure the often pointless, seemingly intimidating questioning from those folks and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer that you could be doing yourself? Save time and money when you use Rock Auto. Rock Auto is a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. Their prices are reliably low for every customer. They have everything you can need, brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, and even new carpet. Here's what you need to do. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Right, Locked On Blue Devils in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know that we sent you amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Visit rockauto.com. Final few moments here today, a Wednesday edition of Locked On Blue Devils. Today is April 6th, 2022. The uh, college basketball season has come to a close. Duke, unfortunately, falling in the Final Four to North Carolina. It is a game that we quickly want to forget, but unfortunately uh, aren't going to quite do that. For the first time this season, and I need the honest reaction. I'm curious if this popped into your mind, because during the game it certainly did for me, Ryan. Did you think about the fact that in that North Carolina game, Trevor Keel scored over 13 points and Duke lost for the first time this season? Yeah, man, that was <laughs> that was tough. And, I couldn't stop thinking about it. I said, he's having and, a great game. This has to go our way. Yeah, and it's just one of those things where all, all of the tournament, we had five guys step up, and in this game we just had, I think it was just three who were over double digits. So, And one of them happened to be Keels. AJ didn't play all that great. Uh, Wendell didn't play all that great. So uh, when Keel stepped up, I was like, oh, my God, like this has to happen. Like we haven't had a game where uh, Griffin or Moore ha- has kind of um, not shown up on the offensive end. And when that didn't happen, that was kind of the kiss of death. And, oh, yeah, it's depressing, man. It, it sucks because Keel showed out and I have a really good – I would have loved our odds against Kansas. We're a much more athletic team. Um we just ran into that North Carolina buzz on. I'm confident Keels would have had another big game off the bench, uh, especially. And, and one thing I don't even think anybody mentioned on Twitter and I didn't either is that these big games, wh- why do bench players um, excel a lot in these uh, big final four games? Archie Diacono did for Villanova, Grayson Allen, obviously Trevor Keels now. Um, and I think it just has to do with pressure. There's not as much pressure. You're, you're starting, you're walking out on the court. There's 70,000 people looking at you. You kind of understand the magnitude of it. And you're coming off the bench. You're just kind of free flowing. And like, you're playing with house money. If I don't show, not that they're thinking about this, but if I don't show up, well, I was a bench guy, but if I do show up and show up, like this is my time to shine. I think if Keels would have had the night he had and we won and then would have went out of the national championship and won, you're talking about a top 20 pick at that point. If, if he showed out on the biggest stage, that would have improved his draft stock tremendously. So um, it's just a big bummer, man. I'm happy for Keels to have that kind of to capitalize when he could. Um, but yeah, man, you're right. 13 plus points and <laughs> and we lost just the, so many things went wrong. <laughs> First time of the season that's happened. So we're talking about uh, Duke basketball, obviously the tough end of the year. That bench point is great because you even go to the national championship game, right? All of a sudden North Carolina gets 11 points from Puff Johnson. He was yep. great for them. Uh, Remy Martin came off the bench for Kansas. He was four of six from three. He wasn't missing. He had an outstanding game. It probably is that pressure situation that you're kind of talking about there, but uh, a very, very unfortunate end of the season for Duke men's basketball, who saw the the 2021-2022 season come to a close. Uh, how, how much longer do you, I mean, is this ever the pain ever going to go away from this or uh, sort of the, the old adage, time heals all wounds for you? Yeah, it's weird because I, I don't find myself interacting with a lot of Carolina fans. As weird as that sounds, like they, they come into my mentions, but I just kind of ignore it and, and, and go on. Um, them losing in the championship definitely helped the the process speed up a little bit. Right. And honestly, this um, this new era, like the John Shire era, we have a new coaches coming in. We're going to have hopefully uh, some new players committing to Duke in the next 
actually when this goes out uh, within the next few hours and then within the next week or so. So like we ha I haven't basically outside of uh, Sunday and Monday, the, the grieving process has kind of had to be put aside because, well, we got a lot of stuff, to more, more stuff to focus on. Um, as far as longevity goes, I'm not looking forward to that first game against Carolina, either game against Carolina next year. It's just, we're going to be constantly reminded about it. And that's the other part about it is every highlight you see of Duke North, North Carolina rivalry is going to be the final four one. And we're going to be reminded of it every year, at least twice a year, maybe three times. So that part will suck. Um, but hey, we move on and you never know. It's happened once now. Why can't it happen again in the tournament? And let's see if we can get a different result. From the Tar Heel perspective, we're now 10 years removed from the Austin Rivers shot and they're reminded of it every single time. That's what happens when you've got big time rivalries like this. Unfortunately, as we've been saying, this was the biggest stage. So it's just going to sting a little bit more. And fortunately for you, Ryan, as a lot of people know, as you detailed in your very first appearance on Lockdown Blue Devils when we were kind of talking about the creation of the Duke Nation page, uh, where you're located physically in your personal everyday life, you don't have as many encounters uh, with Tar Heels as some others could. So it is a little bit easier for you to kind of put some blinders up and kind of be distracted by all of it. For sure. And on Twitter, like I, I used to be bad about it. I used to get angry and it like make me mad when Carolina fans would come to my mentions or Kentucky fans are actually worse. But um, at this point, like I feel like I'm old, I'm older now. I've matured a little bit since then. And like I see somebody in my mentions and you just keep scrolling. And at some point they just stop caring about what you have to say and stop trying to bug you. So uh, I, I think the the more painful stuff, like I said, will be around the hype of the rivalry going forward just because you're never going to be able to forget about it. So I think that's where the pain will come from. All right. Last thing for you before we get out of here today on this Wednesday, you mentioned recruiting that also never stops for Duke. Uh, just picked up the commitment from Jared McCain a few weeks ago uh, out of California. Today is April 6th. It's Wednesday, a little bit later today, four o'clock Eastern, uh, 3 p.m. Central Tyrese Proctor an Australian point guard set to make his decision. Mackenzie Baco, his decision coming uh, at some point in the near future as well. Kind of what's the latest there that you're hearing, Ryan? Or are there any other recruiting headlines that Duke fans need to be aware of? No, man, you kind of you kind of nailed it there. I think um, I think Tyrese is – he's will actually be tomorrow, Thursday afternoon. Okay. Um, there, there's some issues with him being from Australia. I think he's actually stateside right now at the Nike Hoop Summit. But, yeah, his his decision will be coming tomorrow, tomorrow Thursday, to <laughs> Thursday, April 7th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. He's choosing between Duke, Arizona, and the G League. He is currently ranked 26 um, by – by one, I think it's or on three recruits, and then I think two, four, seven. I'm not even sure where they have him ranked or if they do yet, since he's international. Uh, six, four, six, five combo guard, mainly a point guard, just versatile as hell. He'd be a huge get. Um, yeah, that that'd be really exciting. My my sources say uh, Duke should be expecting a commitment from him, but um, well, I never want to put that stuff out there and, and say he's going to, because recruiting is a crazy game, man. We've seen it some weird indeed. things, but I think Duke fans will receive some good news there. And likewise with Mackenzie Mbaco, who uh, as of last night, according to Joe Tipton is going to be announcing his decision within the next week or so. Um, and I think Duke fans should expect good news there as well. So John Shire's second class is <laughs> expected to be just as good, if not better. And they're not done yet in that class. Um, so they'll, those two would join the likes of Jared McCain, Sean Stewart, and Caleb Foster. So exciting stuff, man. Um, those two guys and Mbako, who is just a dominant force in the paint. I believe he's like 6'8", 6'9", just looks like a, an absolute uh, beast. He's twenty. He looks like he's 25 years old and ready to play in the NBA. He's a big guy. So a um, lot of exciting stuff, man. The future is bright. Um, I know it seems grim right now for some Duke fans, but uh, things things will continue to get better. And Duke fans absolutely loved the last Australian that played for the team and Jack White. I mean, he yep. was one of the most popular guys on the team. And so anytime we can go down under, as they say, and uh, and bring in another Australian guy, that'd be great. Ryan, this was awesome. Thank you, as always, for joining us here on the program. I mentioned the Twitter, but uh, what else do you got to promote today? Or, or who are some other Duke fans uh, that, that people should follow if they want more insight? Yeah, man. I. Uh... I don't. I think we'll probably do a crazy Twitter live show at some point in the next couple of weeks to just wrap. 
actually it might even be longer than that we kind of like to wait until stuff is set in stone um maybe once a few more decisions get made from from this past season's team uh if you a couple guys to follow obviously everybody knows um duke nba is is zion uh people follow him and then i like uh update duke i think is i think that'd be grant is his name uh he's like up to the minute faster than me with, with news. So he's a good follow, but yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of changes within the next couple months here. We won't get an actual view of our roster for next season for a couple months. We've reached out to some transfers, but a lot of, st- a lot of shoes have to to drop to see what, what happens with next year's roster. Ryan, I appreciate the time, man. We'll do this again soon. Okay. Enjoy the off season. Yeah, I'll do my best, man. Appreciate it, JJ. All right, that's Ryan Lohman at the Duke Nation on Twitter joining us here today on Locked On Blue Devils. That's going to wrap up our show. Thank you so much for listening. Again, trying to put a bow on the end of this 2021-2022 season. Your Duke Blue Devils, ACC champions. Follow us on Twitter at LO underscore Blue Devils. You can follow me on Twitter at underscore JJ underscore Jackson underscore That's going to do it for today's show. As always, go Duke. I'll talk to you tomorrow. My name is JJ Jackson. Thank you and good day.